Welcome to Ethical Considerations in Citizen Science Research with Lisa Rasmussen. We will begin in a couple of minutes. It's on the hour now. Um, we'll begin in about a minute or so. We'll let some people um, trickle into the room. Hi everyone, this is Nancy Shin and today is March 24th, 2021. I am the Research and Data Coordinator for NNLN's Pacific Northwest Region and I'm your host for today's session. Today's class is brought to you by NNLN's RDM Working Group as part of their special coordinated RDM webinar series on ethical considerations in research data management. Over the last year, we featured a different RDM speaker to speak on our theme on ethics and research data management. This webinar will be the last in our Ethical Considerations and RDM webinar series. Our topic this month is citizen science, more specifically, ethical considerations and citizen science research. Before I introduce today's speaker, let's take care of some housekeeping things. Today's webinar session is being recorded and we have closed captioning today thanks to Edith. So I thank our closed captioner Edith for being with us today. The recordings will be posted and sent to all who have registered within about two weeks or so, and they will also be on the NNLM YouTube channel. The links to the webinar evaluation will be provided at the end of the class. For those that want the MLACE, the evaluation will have a code for you to use to get your MLACE once you fill out the evaluation. For the sake of a speaker, you are all automatically muted, but any questions that you have, you can type in the chat box. I will collect all the questions in the chat box throughout the session. So without further ado, let's meet our webinar speaker. Today, we are very lucky to have an amazing person lead us through today's talk on ethical considerations in citizen science research. Lisa M. Rasmussen earned her PhD in philosophy with a focus on bioethics in Rice University in 2003. She joined the Department of Philosophy at UNC Charlotte in 2006, where she has served as the Undergraduate Program Director in Ethics and Applied Philosophy MA program. She currently serves as a Professor of Philosophy and Faculty Fellow in the Graduate School with a particular focus on fostering a campus-wide culture of research integrity. Now, let me hand it over to Lisa to start this webinar. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here and for giving me a little bit of your time to talk about ethical considerations in citizen science. So I just wanted to start out by explaining how I came to citizen science from philosophy. Uh, my focus was on bioethics 
in for my degree and in particular clinical ethics, the, the kind of thing that involves ethical uh, ethics committees in the hospital or ethics consultation when families and patients and care providers get into arguments or um, have disagreements about what ought to happen. <clears throat> and when I took this job at UNC Charlotte, I was asked to teach a graduate course in research ethics, which was in my area, um, but I hadn't done as much work initially in that. So it quickly became my research area. And in the process of doing that, I realized just how much academics tend to focus on what's going on in academia, which is maybe not a huge surprise, but it was really put in a stark relief for me when I started to learn about citizen science, <clears throat> as well as other fields like biohacking that I find really fascinating that are that involve research outside of the academic setting. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm coming from as I think about these ethical issues, which is to say, <clears throat> excuse me, I went the wrong direction. It's important to think about citizen science in the context of what I call and some colleagues call traditional or establishment science. So um, before I sort of look at this, the rest of the material on this slide, I just wanted to um, give you the large scale view of this, which is we have a certain way we've carved up research ethics, and it usually depends on institutions. Right. So the boundaries of citizen science and the boundaries of traditional science, <clears throat> excuse me, are not the same. And citizen scientists may or may not partner with research institutions and may or may not be conventionally trained. And I want to rush to say this is not the same as claiming that they are not intelligent or trained in some way or don't know what they're doing, right? It just means that they haven't necessarily gone through the usual paths we see like master's degrees and PhDs, um, although they might have. But if they're not partnering with research institutions uh, and they haven't gone through these conventional training paths, then they might not have ever received training in research ethics and they might or might not be subject to ethics regulations. So why is that? Well, it's because this is a great quote that kind of summarizes it. In the United States and other countries, research ethics, quote, operates through a logic of institutional research that is managed through a set of institutional practices. And so just as some examples of that, we've got um, regulations for research ethics, like research misconduct hearings. We've got mandates for research ethics training of students and things like that. <clears throat> and so the main tension that I have seen when thinking about ethical issues in citizen science is that citizen science is often extra institutional, meaning not necessarily connected to an institution. And there's a historical reason for that. <clears throat> so just to give you the kind of 10,000 foot view, around the time of the Second World War, a man named Vannevar Bush, who was an engineer, I believe, was um, the president of MIT. And I guess at the time, apparently MIT was struggling for funds. It's hard to imagine that in retrospect. But he was successful in arguing that the federal government should fund research at MIT. And so after the war, he was asked to kind of conceive of how to proceed with research, um, given how successful research had turned out to be in World War II, <clears throat> the government was very interested in continuing that research. So he, with um, President um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, sort of started a program that really hugely expanded the amount of funding that research institutions were getting from the federal government. So why is that important? Well, because when you have a bunch of money going to just a small number of places and you want to control what's done with that money in the sense of ethics, then it's pretty easy just to attach requirements or regulations to that money. So, uh, you know, a lot of this extra funding started to flow right after World War II. <clears throat> and then by 1974, 1973, um, the United States found out about the Tuskegee study in which African-American men in Alabama with syphilis were studied without being given penicillin. And so there was outrage uh, over that study and the government decided to do something about it, which was um, ended up being expressed in regulations, right? So again, the funding is going to the research institutions. 
you need to do something about how they're using it ethically. So you attach the regulations to the money that's going to the institutions. So, and that matters a lot because that, that whole event in history has um, structured the way that we think about ethical issues in research in ways that I think will become clear in a minute. And, and it's also worth noting that other countries do it differently. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's something in my throat. So um, here is, uh, this came from, um, as, as do many of these points in, in this talk, from a paper that was published this year, uh, thinking about research ethics and citizen science. And I, I apologize, it's kind of wordy, but the basic gist of this figure is to say that there are areas of citizen science research in which this, the research is covered by regulations and it's a good fit and we don't really have to worry about that too much. But there is, these areas are not necessarily proportional. It's hard to figure out how many projects are affected or not by regulations. But there are projects that are covered by regulations, but the ethics don't fit. And then there are projects where the ethics of the regulations are appropriate, but they're actually not regulated, which means both there's nobody overseeing their work, but also there's no one to whom they can turn like an institutional review board that might give them help if they're struggling with something uh, in their research. So I think the upshot of this is citizen science has to build additional ethics capacity. And this is gonna turn out to be more <laughs> challenging than it might seem, partly because of the overwhelming institutional logic of these ethics um, approaches. So <clears throat> let's look at um, what might be required to do that, right? What are the ethical issues in citizen science and what is being done or can be done to start to address them um, and build capacity in citizen science? So this is just an overall um, view of kind of some clusters of ethical issues. And I'm going to try and go through these quickly so that we can spend a little more time talking about the potential solutions. Um, one is data quality and access. Um, two is accountability, meaning being responsible, taking public responsibility for the work. Uh, another is somehow acting on the research results and being accountable back to the people who participate in it. There's a whole host of issues in number four about money, labor, compensation, exploitation, credit, things like that. Uh, collaboration and power dynamics, and then some other um, new issues that are uh, kind of don't fit into any of these categories. And I should say, I'm not looking at the chat right now. So Nancy's going to um, handle those for me and feed them to me because otherwise I'll get distracted. But please feel free to interrupt with questions if you have them. Okay, so let's look at data quality and access. Um, there's a saying in research ethics, which is that bad science is bad ethics. If you don't have good quality in your science, it's just unethical science because at the very least it's just wasting resources, even if they're fairly minimal, like people's time or a few dollars here or there. So quality, good, decent quality is required for ethical research. So there's a concern that citizen scientists might lack formal training and therefore not be able to produce the kind of quality research that so-called traditional scientists do. And I think it's, I don't have it written here, but it's important to mention that um, many people have taken on these arguments and given very good responses to them. And in fact, statistical um, and empirical evidence suggests that there's comparable quality in what's being produced by citizen scientists. Um, there's a lack of access to conventional dissemination, and that includes um, a variety of things. One is you might not have as much peer vetting as other papers because you're not submitting them to a journal for publication. And this looks ahead to the money issue, but if you don't have the money to, to uh, publish open access papers, it's going to be hard for you to um, get things published these days. <clears throat> you might also have decreased ability to share your knowledge. So imagine a lit review in a paper that's done by a citizen scientist who only has access to open access papers, right? So take a lit review or a bibliography or reference list and take out everything mentally that requires uh, a library subscription or affiliation with an institution to access and imagine where that puts you in terms of your science. So for one thing, just superficially, it might mean that 
Uh, citizen scientists have a hard time getting published because their lit review isn't as thorough as it could be, but it also might mean a waste of time because they weren't able to find that paper that already did the thing that they're proposing to do. Uh, data management is another concern, so a lack of training might compromise how you keep your data, uh, which can lead to bad quality science, can lead to um, some problems if people want to question your results later, and it also might, um, looking down the list a little bit, <clears throat> accidentally allow the data that you have in a citizen science project to be accessible to people in a way that you didn't mean for it to be. Um, you might have potential conflicts of interest when researchers or advocates or activists. So we think of researchers as these objective, third-party neutral kinds of people. And if you get too involved in a project, we tend to think then you might be uh, conflicted about that. And I'll kind of return to that at the end. Um, and then if you have a group of people collaborating with each other, they may have the expectation that they can all access the data that they're all contributing. But they may also think that they have privacy vis-a-vis -vis other people in the project. So there's a tension there in how you resolve people's expectations about privacy versus access to data. And then, ironically, publication paywalls may also affect citizen scientists' access to the own, their very own data that they contributed to a project. So there are a bunch of questions here about data quality and access. In terms of accountability, um, because there are no formal oversight mechanisms in this kind of extra institutional citizen science, it's not clear what we can um, set up or what is set up in terms of how to help make sure that citizen science is being done ethically. So in, within an institution, you're probably all familiar with the fact that we've got IRBs, we have IACUCs to oversee animal research, we have people to look into research misconduct, um, allegations and things like that. But in citizen science, you don't have access to any of those things. And again, this is not to say that citizen scientists are unethical. They may be in fact more ethical than conventional researchers, who knows, but to the extent that we need oversight and to the extent that they might want outside advice on their own proactively, they might not have access to it. There are also new accountabilities, which is a kind of accountability to the communities who are helping to do the research, to conduct the research, or uh, in, in which you're doing the research. So I'm going to talk about that in the next slide here. So um, one of the things that um, is new, a new term to me anyway, is something called a report back. So we are used to, say, in, in bioethics, thinking about uh, adverse events or sorry, when, when something happens in research that you didn't anticipate, that's bad, or incidental findings, they're called. So you, you do a scan on someone as a part of research, and then all of a sudden you see in the scan that they've got uh, some kind of a growth. And then the question is, what do you do with that, right? So that's um, incidental findings. Uh, but in citizen science, there might be an expectation that when you do research with a community, the community expects to get report back to them, reported back to them, both what the research showed and what it means in context. So let's say you're contributing readings of your local air or water. Uh, researchers might typically think, okay, well, when I've published or presented it, then I'm done. Uh, but the community says, I don't care about the publications or presentation. You need to come back to us and tell us um, what you found, right? And so there may be ethical issues. Now, again, these look very different than we're used to thinking about ethical issues in normal research. We don't think that if you don't go back to someone who contributed to your research and report to them that you've done something ethically wrong. Uh, maybe we're wrong about that, but in citizen science, there's much stronger expectation of a kind of mutual accountability in research. So this is a really important issue in citizen science. Um, there also is an expectation that the research should be done in order to solve a problem, not just to generate scientific knowledge and contribute to public knowledge, right, which are um, the goods of research, as most of them, most of us academically would understand it. But it's not necessarily the priority of the groups who are doing the research with you. Okay, here is a whole host of issues um, about money, basically. 
Um, conventional researchers like myself, like some of you probably have a job, we're funded with grant money or whatever we need from our institutions. We have clear incentives to, you know, get tenure, get promotion, get a longer contract, whatever it is that, that we're doing for our job. Um, and it's all kind of known to all of us, even if it's highly um, unequal or inequitable. We know what we're talking about. We know that we're incentivized to produce this knowledge, that publications are good, that citations are good, et cetera. In citizen science, though, um, they're, they're heterogeneous, right? So they're not just one thing. But um, as a whole, they just don't look like conventional researchers for the most part. They may not have jobs at all. They may not have jobs in science. They may be doing this on the side as a hobby, just for fun. They may be poor. They may be wealthy. Uh, they may have a little bit of grant funding. They might not. And they have different incentives. And so there's a real danger of exploiting citizen scientists as free labor if we're not being careful and attending to that ethical issue. And in fact, um, there was a paper published a couple of years ago by someone in Europe who pointed out that Europe, um, the European Union has embraced citizen science. And they say specifically in the whatever document it was that kind of officially embraces it, that this is a great way to save money for research, right? So we have to really think about what that means for the people who are doing this work. Um, another issue is citizen scientists may not receive credit in publications or in other ways for their contributions. So we might think, oh, they're just donating their data. They don't need to be authors or whatever, but they might merit authorship. They might want authorship. And they might not want any of that, but they want something different, like some, some money to pay them for their time, or they might want uh, some recognition on a website or in a different kind of a publication on the news or something. So we have to rethink the way that we recognize people and compensate them for what they've done on behalf of research in citizen science. There are also some, and this is related to the previous slide about exploitation, but there are collaboration and power dynamics in citizen science because university researchers are used to being the leaders of the research. They're used to driving the research question, driving the conduct of research. Uh, and so it is not unusual to see researchers go in as though they're bringing knowledge to the unwashed and the ignorant, right? That somehow... We have the knowledge, we're gonna generously share it with the community who are doing this cute little thing of donating data. Um, I think most people wouldn't actually say they think that, but sometimes the behavior suggests that they do think that. So citizen scientists, on the other hand, might actually be the leaders and they might be the ones driving the research and, and maybe approach the institutional researcher to partner with them or, uh, they might say, look, let's do this together and we bring important goods and resources to the project and so do you and so let's work on this together. <clears throat> so that's a power dynamic thing that has to be navigated and can look very different in each case. Um, collaboration might also require clarifying who counts as the community and who speaks for the community. And I think this is this can be a really tricky question because it's not the case necessarily that you can go to a community find one person who represents themselves as speaking for the community and just trust that whatever that person says is right. You have to do, I think, some kind of work to know whether the community does actually look to this person as a leader and someone who speaks for them. But you also need to think about what, where's the room for dissent in those kinds of circumstances. Okay, and then finally, just a host of other kind of random issues that are, I think, really interesting. There's self-experimentation, um, including among a, a group of collaborators. So there's a website called um, Patients Like Me, where you can register according to whatever condition you have, and you can partner with other people in institutional research or as a group of self-experimenters. So there's a group from that platform who published a self-study on consuming lithium, I think, for um, uh, the condition escapes me. I can't think of it at the moment. But um, then the question is, well, what are the ethical issues there when you just get a bunch of people to agree to do something to themselves and publish it, right? 
Um, there's, there are questions of research with indigenous communities or along the U.S.-Mexico border about how you navigate, um, who owns the data, uh, how you collaborate together, um, things like that. Uh, there's the, the more general term, I mean, the general question, should this term citizen even be used? How do we credit citizen scientists appropriately? And then this new conflict of interest um, that I mentioned earlier, which is, well, if you are an advocate for a certain outcome, does that diminish your scientific objectivity? And again, there are people who have argued that it does not. So in general, the kinds of things that we want to see as solutions to ethical issues in citizen science are things that I think are um, possible they're not actually solving the problem entirely. So one is you can partner, you you as a citizen scientist or, or a group of citizen scientists could potentially partner with institutional researchers to access their resources. So for example, it would be a fantastic public service if librarians could advocate within their institutions for access to certain citizen science groups, right? Not throwing it open, but maybe there's a way to negotiate contracts where you're allowed to have a certain number of um, public members who can access your library. Um, but it's only a partial solution because a lot of citizen scientists just aren't going to have access to such partners. Um, and it's not clear that the IRB is going to be willing to, for example, take liability uh, or the IACUC over a group um, that they can't then evaluate. Um, there's the question of um, finding and following disciplinary norms that could help citizen scientists. For example, uh, if you're doing some kind of ecology project, there are ways of blurring gra geographic location data and sort of you have the data point, but there's some kind of a program that automatically blurs it to depending on what the scale is of what you're looking for, not not uh, lower resolution than 50 feet or 50 miles or something like that. Um, the challenges here are the norms may not be publicly accessible. Some groups might not even know they exist to begin with, and they might not know what questions to ask, right? It might not occur to some citizen scientists, oh, well, if I, if I record the geographic coordinates of this endangered species, someone might use those if they can find it in my database to go and get these endangered species and sell them on the black market, right? Or kill them because that's what they like to do or something like that, right? So there are ethical considerations about geographic data. Uh, and then, then there's also this other question, which is in a way much bigger, that they might just disagree with those disciplinary norms. Just, just because we have disciplinary norms doesn't mean they're categorically right always and everywhere. And so citizen scientists may, may just disagree and, and choose to do things a different way. So there's a lot of work to do uh, in the ethics of citizen science. And it's really at the very beginning of building ethics capacity, just like it is trying to build other capacities like the need for funding. And so um, when we were talking about this um, presentation, um, you know, it was the information was conveyed to me that what we might be more interested in talking about is the solutions to these problems. And I think that's right, except that there aren't a lot of them to be had quite yet. So uh, I'm involved in a grant, for example, to work on trustworthy data practices, and we are about two years into a three-year project. So we're hoping to produce a toolbox that will be um, freely accessible to anyone on the internet that help people think about how to manage their data, how to protect their data, how to navigate um, citizen science agreements and things like that. But more generally, as we think about how to solve this kind of an issue, I think what we need to do is um, keep in mind the challenges and the needs we have. So the challenges are that citizen science is global, it's interdisciplinary, it's multidisciplinary, and it's diverse. And so that means that there is one lever or one solution that is going to help us because, of course, some of these things are going to get tangled up with local law and policy, where local is everything from the, you know, level of the European Union to the nation, to a state, to a territory. Um, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the word for um, some of the other countries, uh, like territories and things like that. Anyway. 
uh, there isn't a solution that is going to be necessarily effective in all of those contexts. So we need something, though, for uh, some mechanism for trust in citizen science that can somehow bridge all of this big, messy territory. Regulations and national laws can cover some, but not all of it. Tort law or law um, based on harm or damage can't cover all of it. So what I have in mind here is, um, let's say I was part of your citizen science project and your um, your research either physically hurt me somehow or exposed my address on the internet in a way that made me the target of something, right? So I could sue you in civil court for um, recovering damages, but that's going to be very expensive. Most people are not be able to do that. It's going to take a very long time to build enough laws that other people could understand what the signals were about harm, et cetera. So I don't think that's going to be very effective. Disciplinary rules and norms are too limited for a variety of reasons. And then even all of this together wouldn't be enough for us to really think about what makes ethical citizen science. So my conceptual solution here, at least the way that I've been thinking about lately, is something called a trust architecture. So a trust architecture is a system of structures. Uh, I guess it could be one structure, but usually a system of structures that enables us to put trust in something. So for example, we have um, federal deposit insurance in the bank. We don't just trust that if we go put our money in a bank, it's gonna stay there and nobody's gonna rob it, uh, things like that. We trust when we get on a plane that uh, the plane's gonna take off. And for the most part, it's gonna be safe and I'm gonna get where I'm going without me having to understand how to evaluate the safety of a plane and whether it's being kept up, right? So we have these, these systems in place that let us just trust what we're doing. We need something like that in citizen science. And I think in conventional research, we have a lot of these mechanisms like the IRB and research misconduct and things like that. We just need to build something in citizen science. So some challenges are, as I said, there's not a single lever that's gonna work. There are some really deep conceptual challenges also. So for example, in the United States regulations, we have a very clear definition of a human subject in need of protection as someone who, were they to be involved in research, would require that research to be subjected to the IRB oversight, right? But a human subject in the context of citizen science is a curious thing, because if you're collecting bird sighting data, are you a human subject? Well, if we're collecting your location, because that's part of your bird sighting, then according to those federal regulations, you actually are a human subject, but you're not ethically a human subject in the kind of way that we think is important for something like biomedical research, right? I mean, you need oversight because you are the person who's choosing to upload this data, right? Why do we need protection for you from something you're just doing anyway? There are financial challenges, which is all of this stuff, this infrastructure costs a lot of money. And citizen scientists often have little to no funding to pay for architecture. And one of the reasons for that is that they don't have the accounting mechanisms required for receiving federal funding or, or um, nonprofit funding sometimes. There are also these really interesting constitutional or legal challenges, because if we try and say a group of people who are all consenting adults who want to publish something that they did together um, has to be overseen in some way by research ethics regulations, that actually could come up against their First Amendment rights. Um, both for speech and assembly, because if, if a group of us just sit around and we, we want to collect the number of uh, books on each other's shelves and publish the results, then what's wrong with that, right? Why do we need to have somebody else tell us how to do that ethically? And then there are ideological challenges, which is um, citizen science has, has these really different arms in it. One is something like a hacker ethos, people who are just want to move fast and break things. And then there's also the really community-driven side of it. And, and it doesn't seem to me that those two sides are easily going to come to um, consensus about how to proceed ethically with uh, citizen science research ethics structures. So here are a couple of thoughts um, about research ethics structures in citizen science. One way you might go is um, with a kind of idea of radical transparency, right? So that 
if you assume that one way to keep from doing unethical things is just to do everything out in the open, and that's going to discourage people from acting unethically, um, you might just say, well, whatever you do as a citizen science project, just put it all out there, put it on the website or something. But I think there's a lot of problems with that. Um, for one thing, we know people do the wrong things in public on a regular basis. Um, but also in sort of more, more nuanced, um, if we have too much information, we become the shopper in the toothpaste aisle who just can't make a decision without a huge cognitive burden on the 52 toothpastes that are in front of us, right? And so if what we're saying is, let's just let the public evaluate all citizen science projects, that puts a huge burden of being a consumer of citizen science on the consumer of the research or on some putative group of volunteers who would look that over. So it just doesn't seem like that's going to, I'm not arguing against transparency. I'm just suggesting that this kind of approach as though that's all we need isn't going to work. We also might have something like a voluntary subscription for accountability where we say, okay, I'm going to pay in some money and I'm going to say with this money, I hereby promise to hold myself liable or accountable to this set of principles, whatever it happens to be. And, and those can be developed by the citizen science community. And you can say, okay, I'm going to, when I have a citizen science project, we are all going to pitch in a dollar. We're going to have a hundred dollars at the end of the day, and we'll pay for our little um, badge that says we're, we're holding ourselves accountable. And then the money could maybe be used um, by some organization to pursue um uh, some kind of action against someone who's done something wrong. Notice how vague my language is here, right? It's trying to imagine how this would work. So the challenge is that it requires a central organizing body, which we're starting to see. There's the um, Citizen Science Association in the United States, which is kind of a global group. There's European Citizen Science Association, Australian Citizen Science Association. I just saw recently that Brazil is starting one. Um, so we have maybe the beginnings of those central organizing bodies, but Again, back to the earlier point that citizen science projects just don't have very much money. So even coming up with $100 for this voluntary subscription for accountability just doesn't seem feasible for a lot of them um, and not necessarily the, the way they really want to spend their money anyway. Um, we might also have a sort of collective accountability where we say that um, we're going to have a set of different standards and you just follow one of them. Um, but if we have too many of them, then we end up back with the problem in the first solution where the consumer of the research needs to figure out what standards did this project say it was going to be following and to have to figure that out first. And then also, do I trust them to have done that? So that can be um, really challenging in a way that I think impedes this, the possibility for that solution. So where I am currently, as I'm thinking about it, um, and again, I'll just emphasize that none of these structures have been built yet in citizen science. We really are just trying to figure this out. And to the extent that there are ethical solutions right now, it's through partnerships with people who are subject to these institutional regulations. So I think the way I'm thinking about it now is um, we, we, we're going to need some kind of negotiated trust where... The initiators of citizen science projects will have the responsibility for establishing acceptable basis of their research. So, for example, um, you can get a project going and ask your participants and collaborators, what, what, what is it to do this work ethically? And I think as we get more and more, there are going to be some like templates being built. So if, if a group of um, bird counters, right? publishes a set of standards they follow and other people say, yeah, those sound really good, then you might start to see some coalescing around a set of standards. So it'll take a lot of work to begin with, but then for a lot of projects, some of that will be built. Um, we might also start to build freer and expensive tools. And I think that's where our grant comes in um, to help people think about how to do that. So we want to have tools about how to make your data open access, right? Which kinds of license you might think about for that. 
how to um, ask your participants what information they would or would not like to be shared about themselves, about their role. We want to uh, build some templates about how to have conversations about acknowledging citizen scientists in your work, right? So some of this really is just about conversation and this negotiated trust that you just, each project can be so very different that you need to talk to the people who are actually doing the work to figure out what counts as ethical for them. I think societies can play a role here in particular. For example, if you have you know, an ornithology society, they can say, well, look, here's, here's a set of best practices that we've come up with. And then citizen science projects can decide whether they want to um, join them or not. Um, you might also want to start to develop structures and procedures aimed at equalizing power standing in these relationships, because as long as institutional researchers are the ones with the funding and the resources, they're going to be deriving the research to a large extent. And also, even when they collaborate with people, if they're holding the purses, they're going to have more power and standing. So trying to equalize that a little bit would be good. And then I think there's a remaining question of where does the locus of responsibility lie for making sure that ethical research, that, that research is being done ethically? Is it every single person who contributes? Is it located um, with the project manager in some sense or the principal investigator, if we use that kind of a term? Uh, so I think some of that is really still up in the air. I think there's a difference between what we would expect of people who are just contributing some data points versus people who are driving the research questions, formulating the hypotheses, et cetera. Um, and um, I think I'm gonna leave it at that point and see what questions we have so far. Nancy? Okay, thank you, Lisa, for such an amazing talk. Um, I have... Um been keeping my eye on the chat box and it doesn't look like there are any questions in the chat box but I just wanted to remind people that as we're wrapping up the presentation this is a great opportunity for you to think up some questions that you may have for Lisa that she could respond to um I have a question for you Lisa sure. um has there been any case in the literature where a citizen science project has been retracted because of a violation of ethics? Not to my knowledge. Uh, and, and it's interesting too, because not all citizen science research will end up with publications, right? So, so even to get to the point where you have a retraction, um, it already looks starts to look more institutional and less purely citizen science-y, if I can um, say it that way. Um, I know there there have been objections to some citizen science projects. For example, in the um, uh, Detroit or the Flint water crisis, um, there were there was a, an institutional researcher who went in and worked with citizens in um, in the municipal area to do water testing and to demonstrate that there was in fact lead in the water. Um, but there were some different um, constituencies in the community, some of whom didn't like the way that that institutional researcher was operating, was treating them, was representing things, and others who did. And so from the outside, I think it's particularly difficult when you have some a community that's divided. Um, in this case, to my knowledge, there weren't any retractions or corrections issued. Um, but that doesn't mean it can't still happen, right? Okay, awesome. And I don't see anyone hearing more questions in the chat, but I have another question for you. Okay. Um, as someone, if someone is, as someone who is potentially interested in citizen science and doing citizen science research, how should I approach citizen science? Should I withhold my participation until there is until there's more guidance in terms of ethics in terms of, with regards to my rights as a citizen scientist, or should I just, um, just proceed? <laughs> um, no, I think that's a great question. It's sort of, you know, should I be complicit if the system is wrong? Um, I don't think you should have any hesitation in general about contributing to citizen science. Um, 
I think that depending on who you are and what you do, those kinds of things, you're going to have a different set of um, concerns. So for example, one of the things that we're doing in this grant is partnering with some members of the environmental justice community of citizen science practitioners. And the re there are many reasons for this, but one of the reasons is they have knowledge that's important to the success of our project. And we don't think we should um, take that from them as volunteer work. Uh, we think we should pay them for some of that knowledge, right? Because this is a group of people who continually are being asked to volunteer their time for other people then to go on with their projects and become successful, publish it, things like that. Um, and so there's actually a, a term for that that I've heard recently, which is academic extraction. When you go into a community, you take the knowledge that they have um, learned and established maybe sometimes through suffering and through unfair treatment, uh, and then you publish it and you get the glory uh, from doing that, that seems unethical. And so there are certain kinds of research you might not want to participate in. You might want to ask questions about well, what's going to happen to this research? What am I going to get out of it? Am I going to be paid? Am I? Um, and, and, and it's not to say that you need to be paid, right? Some of us, for example, if, if you're taking a walk on a trail and there's a a sign posted that says, hey, help us out with some citizen science. Take pictures of these three animals if you see them and send it to this email address, right? That might just be really fun to do. You like the, this area, um, you like hiking, it gives you something to look for, and you just want to contribute, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so there are a variety of levels of participation in citizen science that might drive your decision too. Okay, awesome. There's two things in the chat box. One is a comment. Um, when, uh, someone by the name of Patience has, says, says, great presentation, Lisa. Thanks, and she thanks. wanted to know if the presentation will be available on YouTube. And yes, it will be available on YouTube. Um, and it is being recorded. So don't worry about that. And then the other thing that I want to address from the chat box is a question from Eric. Um, he asks, if citizen science is driven by a profit motive, does that change the ethical framework being proposed? That's a great question, Eric. Thank you for that. And it reminded me of something I meant to say earlier. Um, so I guess I'll say first that, you know, the big philosophical question here is how you feel about capitalism, I guess, and um, profit and competition. And obviously, we're not going to solve that problem. And we, between all of us, we probably disagree to some extent about that. Um, so I think that the conflicts of interest might be different when there's a profit motive. So if you if you look at contemporary biomedical research, there is a requirement that people presenting or publishing on their work disclose whether they have any potential conflicts of interest, which is usually interpreted as being sponsored by or being given money in some fashion by some entity you're covering in your research. The typical example is, you know, you, you get money from big pharma company <clears throat> and, oh, it just so happens that your results are all always in favor of the big pharma company who's giving you the money, right? There's, there's a version of that which is unproblematic because maybe it's just a really good product. But then what we all suspect sometimes is that you keep you want to keep getting that money and so you keep giving them the results they want. So I think it can look a little bit different in citizen science. And the thing that I'm worried about, which is kind of um, a next door neighbor to your concern, I think is, well, if we know we've got the citizen science stuff going on, um, is there an incentive for people to avoid regulatory oversight by calling something citizen science that normally would have been subject to IRB oversight or something like that? Um, in terms of medical products, citizen science doesn't help us very much because in order to get approved in the United States, you have to go to the FDA. And the FDA is going to require, no matter how you did this research, that you went to the IRB and you had appropriate oversight. So just calling yourself citizen science isn't going to get you around that. But what I'm more worried about is, um, there was a 
an article that I saw that sort of captured this idea for me perfectly. It was called The Godfather of Alt Science. And it was about a man who used to be at the Salk Institute, very well-respected scientist, who now has, for some reason, a mass spectrometer in his basement along with 5,000 urine samples. And he and his three sons do research on those urine samples. And so there's a whole bunch of questions in that little story that should make you raise your eyebrows. Um, but if you're interested in, in complicating and seeding literature and science with falsehoods in the way that we've seen in the news, it seems like citizen science might be a way you could go. Um, with, with few or no opportunities for oversight, I think it could be easier to do that than, than we might think. Okay, awesome. I see a question in the chat box from Melanie. Uh, Melanie says, this was such an interesting talk. Could you speak to the A, B testing or other remote website experimentation, especially on government or medical websites or Google search results? Sure. And this, this um, probably for the most part takes us away from citizen science, but it's actually the way I found citizen science to begin with. Uh, so about 10 years ago, there was a paper, in, I mean, a, an article in the New York Times about Target. And I don't know, some of you might remember this. Um, no, I know it's a, I can see the chat now. Yeah, it's a tangential question, but it is related. Um, and they were talking about the data people in Target um, doing a project. So it turns out that we are, we tend to be locked into our shopping um, choices, except in a few big life events, like when we get married, or when we have a baby, or when we move. And so Target was trying to figure out, well, how do we get shoppers away from our competition and to our store? Well, maybe if we can find out that they're going to have a baby before other stores find that out, we can start sending them coupons and then they'll come to us and that might switch them over to us entirely. And so they found out by combing their data that um, there were a few precursors to somebody having a baby, which was buying fragrance-free products and unsurprisingly, prenatal vitamins. And so by looking at the shopping patterns of their shoppers, they could predict who was likely to have a baby and they would send them coupons for discounts on baby clothes and things like that. And um, so in this particular case in the story, they had a man whose 18 year old daughter lived with him and she started getting these coupons and he went and complained to Target. Um, so what are you trying to get my daughter to get pregnant. And she said, well, actually dad, I, I'm pregnant. So um, it turned out that they were good at this and they, they managed this successfully. So the reason I go through all that is to say, if somebody at an academic institution wanted to do that research, I don't think the IRB would have approved it, but because it's a store, they can do whatever they want. And then very soon after that, Melanie, I started to see a lot of the kinds of things you're talking about um, with Facebook, Google, um, you know, those two in particular, but I'm sure all the social media um, companies are doing it with AB research. And so there was the, um, the emotional contagion study at Facebook, where Facebook was tracking whether if you see uh, posts that are more likely to be sad, then you're more likely to post sad things in response, which turned out to be very small um, effect, but very um, with a high confidence interval, right? So that it was true that if you started to see more positive or negative things in your feed, you would respond accordingly to a certain extent. There was also the um, voter button. So if you post that you voted on Facebook, just, just by um, Facebook making that available to people and people then choosing freely to post it, that can drive up voting behavior in the demographic group that is on Facebook, right? So, so it's conceivable that they could sway the election by virtue of having that button. So there's all kinds of things like that going on. And because um, they're corporations, they're not covered by these regulations. So I just find that really fascinating. Uh, and, and it turns out that on Facebook, for example, 
if you're on Facebook, you might be in half a dozen to a dozen experiments at any given time, because that's how many of these AB studies they're doing. And I should have started out by explaining the AB studies when you present people, um, two groups of people with different options, and you see what the effects are of each of those. Um, and it can be literally like, what color pink should this button be? And one of you is an A and one of you is a B, and then you see if that drives some kind of behavior that you're looking for. So um, I think that it's very interesting to see that this is happening. The other place that's interesting, sorry to perseverate a little bit, it is um, a field called experimental political science, which is new. And they're, they're doing things like sending out AB versions of voter um, cards for, and some, sometimes this is being done by actual campaigns and they're trying to see which one is more effective in some way. Uh, but there have been some significant problems with those and I won't go into those, but you can Google that. So I hope that answered your question, Melanie, or at least responded to it. <laughs> okay, awesome, Lisa. Um, Melanie says, wow, thank you. Um, thank you. We do have about six more minutes until, um, the, um, until the hour. So if you have any more questions, feel free, feel free to put them in the chat box and I'll read them out to Lisa. So I'll give you a few moments to think up some more questions if you have any questions at this time. And maybe I'll go back to these, um, this summary kind of area here. I will say too, um, one of the things I've heard um, express, which makes complete sense, but um, something I didn't really think about is indirect funding in grants. So obviously when we are fortunate enough to win a grant, um, sometimes up to 55, 60% in addition to that grant money goes directly to our institution. So if you have a $100,000 grant, the granting agency might give you $155,000 and $55,000 of that goes to your institution for things like keeping the lights on, getting you internet access, um, doing the paperwork, the massive amount of paperwork that grants take. And so that all makes sense to me, but um, one of the things that citizen science groups can get frustrated with appropriately, I think, is if you partner with the citizen science group, the university has to be the one to monitor and manage those grant funds, which means they get all of the indirect funds. Meanwhile, there might be a citizen science or community group who is also doing that same kind of work, but not getting the indirect funds. So there's this additional layer of taking advantage of the existing system um, and how it works for funding and things like that. Mm. Well, that's an interesting point, Lisa. I never really thought about the indirect funding that goes yeah. to institutions. So yeah, that's definitely an interesting point. Okay, uh, looks like we don't have any more questions in the chat box and we're getting close to the hour. So I am gonna wrap things up now. So before you all go, I wanna thank you for your questions and participation in this webinar.